All right, welcome back to the uh, WashU Nephrology Renal Pass Series. We have an uh, excellent case. I want to introduce our discussants again, Dr. Uh, Joseph Gott, uh, a section head of nephropathology, and we have one of our second year renal fellows here, Dr. Usman Yunus, who's going to walk us through a case. So this is actually a case that was presented as a CPC to me last uh, week. Uh, we're going to present it a little bit differently. We're going to give all of the clinical information up front. We'll go through a brief differential, and then we'll go through what I think is some very interesting renal pathology. So first, the case information. Again, I'm going to give you everything all at once. This was a 30-year-old Caucasian male, otherwise healthy, was noted to have proteinuria during an insurance physical. It was quantified at 1.8 grams a day with a 24-hour collection. He has no past medical history, is not on any meds, has no family history or renal disease in the family. His review system is positive for some very mild edema, and he did have some uh, tingling in his arms. His blood pressure uh, and exam were otherwise unremarkable. He was not edematous. His creatinine was normal, albumin 4.1, hemoglobin 14.3. He had 3 plus protein on the urine urinalysis, trace blood, and like I said already, 1.8 grams per day. The serologic workup that was provided was here. You can see that for the most part it is negative. ANA, ANCA, C3, C4, serum and urine, protein electrophoresis, and immune fixation all negative along with a negative infectious workup and a normal kidney ultrasound. So let me ask you before we jump into the case, Usman, what was the differential discussed at the time? So I think we are discussing a fairly young guy who really has no other symptoms, who um, is found to have subnephrotic proteinuria on otherwise, who's completely otherwise healthy, um, and who also has um, hematuria, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, trace blood. Trace mm -hmm. blood, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and his albumin is okay, all the secondary workup that you have told me is negative. Um, the, first, the first thing that jumps right up front is uh, IgA nephropathy mm -hmm. in this patient. Um, and uh, this age group, um, the, he's fairly young, um, but if he had any of the symptoms, um, abdominal pain, rash in the lower extremity, you could think about the same. Uh, category of the disease, nauseous con lean purpura, mm -hmm. which is again HSP. the tra tra same uh, you know trajectory of the disease mm -hmm. um, fitting into IgA. But apart from that, um, uh, other etiologies become less likely in setting up negative ANA, so right. autoimmune things become less likely. Although he does not have any rash, he's not uh, hypertensive, so other things become also less likely. I agree. I, I cannot make much out of uh, the tingling that he has. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I do not really have a whole lot of things up front with me. He's not nephrotic, um, and his albumin is fairly preserved. So a lot of clinical data that we have is leaning me more towards probably IgA. And, you know, that was exactly kind of my tr uh, train of thought at the time. It was actually hard to think of anything <coughs> other than IgA nephropathy with such right. lack of medical history and a Absolutely. negative serologic workup. Well, let's go into the path and actually see what we find. So, Joe, I'm going to give this one to you, so you should have control of the mouse and you should be able to have a pointer on the screen if you have it. Very good. All right, Usman, what do we have? Uh, what stain are we looking at here? So, we have light microscopy, low power view. Uh, it appears to be a trichrome stain. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do not, so right from this uh, uh, power view, we have tubules that appear to be back to back. I do not have a whole lot of inflammation in between. Um, there's a vessel right in the middle there. Um, mm -hmm. It does not appear to be thickened from this uh, view here. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight glomes here. At this power, do not appear to be any significant pathology. Um, right. So from this power, we really, and on the trichrome in particular, we're looking for chronic, right. chronic changes, you know, interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, but really the trichrome is excellent pulling out that interstitial fibrosis. And like you said, the tubules are back to back. We don't see much dark blue in between intervening in this, in between the tubules to indicate that there's significant chronic damage here. And the vessels, like you said, look relatively of normal thickness. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go ahead and get a higher power view. Okay. Okay. So what stain is this? Um, this appears to be an H&E stain. Very good. Um, again, we are looking at the uh, interstitium with a lot of uh, tubules which appear to be back-to-back. -back. Mm -hmm. um, and the tubules that 
I am seeing some brush border. That should be the proximal. And is this the distal tubules that we are pointing towards? All right. Well, so it's difficult to appreciate the brush border on the H and E stain. Okay. That's best seen on the PAS stain. PAS. It really just kind of blends in in these proximal tubules. If you okay. look really high magnification, you, like right here, maybe you can see some of it. But that's not really what I was pointing at here. So these tubules here look different, right, right than these here with right. this abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, typical of proximal tubules. These are filled with this kind of foamy, vacuolated appearance. I these see. cells are, have this foamy, vacuolated appearance, the epithelial cells of, of these tubules. It's unclear what that represents, but they look different. There's something abnormal going on here. Now, could that just be from proteinuria? Um, this is would be pretty unusual for that. It's, it's an odd appearance, this vacuolated appearance to okay. epithelial cells and tubules. So keep that in mind. Could it be some deposition that is not being picked up in this stain, or it's well, when things are foamy, it typically means it's lipid. Okay. All right, so it's some sort of lipid accumulation in these tubules. Okay. And, and, and sometimes, you know, um, I, I see or hear the word vacuolization in the tubules, and that makes me think of things like, you know, if someone got intravenous immunoglobulin or I think <coughs> cyclosporin and calcineurin inhibitors can cause that sometimes. Right, too. so what, uh, what Dr. Yao is referring to is osmotic nephrosis, mm -hmm. which can happen and shows this kind of foamy vacuolization appearance to tubules and you know, the differential there can be due to IVIG, mm -hmm. contrast administration, mannitol, mm -hmm. um, pedostarch, those types of resuscitated agents can also do it. Okay, let's look at the glomerulus here. Okay. Um, so this is again an H&E stain. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at gloms. Just from this view we can see capillary loops are open. Uh, but the really that's what's striking is there is the place where podocytes are, there is this vacuolated appearing structure which is not predominantly stain positive with H&E hair. Right. Um, it, would you say that it's also vacuolization pattern here? Or it's yeah, it has this very fu full, fullness. Ex exactly. Well, um, you know, I would be as descriptive as possible. So this again has this foamy vacuolate appearance and you're right, most of these, this foamy cytoplasm is in the cytoplasm of those podocytes or the visceral epithelial cells lining the um, external aspect of these capillary loops. So, and they're just stuffed full of these, again, um, this foamy appearance, which typically is seen with lipid accumulation. Now in your differential diagnosis, which was relatively limited, but right. IgA nephropathies, let's talk a little bit about IgA and what we would expect to see in a glomerulus if you ignore kind of the foamy appearance, which is very abnormal and not typical right. for IgA. Right. So what would you expect to see if this were a case of IgA? So I would have expected mesangial uh, uh, proliferation and mesangial expansion, uh, which, which I, we are not really seeing uh, right here. There is probably two or three uh, nuclei per uh, view, right. and so that does not correlate with mesangial hypercellularity. So that becomes down on my list now. Right, so IgA can have a variety of appearances, right. but most commonly is mesangial hypercellularity, which right. is more than three nuclei per little mesangial right. area. And we really don't see that. Um, <coughs> other things that can happen in IgA, endocapillary proliferation, Sometimes segmental glomerular sclerosis, Occasionally you can see crescents, crescents in IgA. Right. You can see a variety of things, but typically it's mesangial hypercellularity. Um, <coughs> and we don't see any of that here. So it drops further down, right. further down on your list. All right, let's see what else we have. Okay, how about this glomerulus? Um, so right here, uh, we have the similar pattern. Again, I'm not seeing any mesangial hypercellularity. We have still vacuolization uh, pattern here in the uh, areas where podocytes usually are um, and there is not specifically although PES would be the best stain to document to see the endocapillary um, thickening capillary wall thickening but we don't really seeing that here no and what do we see what's this so here? this is a, a is it probably a segmental scar that's yes this, right oh. it's a segmental scar right there so we do have some segmental glomerular sclerosis present. So maybe there is an underlying IgA. There's something going on here that's causing this segmental scarring. We do see that. And this kind of glassy appearance that you see here is just some hyalin located in that segmental scarring. But predominantly what we're seeing still is this foamy appearance right. to the podocyte cytoplasm. And here we have it again in some tubules adjacent to this glomerulus. Show you a different stain now. Okay, now this is um, what we have is PAS. Mm -hmm. And 
<coughs> Again, I mean, we are seeing the same pattern that in the podocytes area, it feels like some deposition, as you said, it's vacuolization um, in the areas where the podocytes are, and it's consistent with some lipid accumulation. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there is no mesangial hypercellularity, there is no crescent formation. Uh, here we do not see any segmental scar that we saw, probably a different view here, different glom. Right. Um, and capillary loop still looks open, there is no uh, capillary wall thickening here. And is there anything else that we are missing here? All right, no, that's, that's pretty much it. It's the same thing, it's a different stain. Yes, you can, this is the best way to look at thickness of the capillary right. loops on the PAS stain. You compare a peripheral capillary loop with an adjacent Tubular. tubular basement membrane, you can tell they essentially look to be the same thickness. Right. So no, they're not thickened at all, although membranous was even on your differential, which would be right. the most common presentation there. Right. Um, but certainly we can we can evaluate that on this PS stain. Okay. Here's one more tricky one here. Okay. So we're looking at the same stain here, which is PAS. Very good. Um, so here is is that a segmental scar again that we're seeing? Or what do you think? So it looks a bit unusual compared to the other glomerular right. I've seen, right? It's almost hard to recognize it as a glomerulus. The, the whole glomerular tuft has, is shrunken down here in this little ball. Wow. And then on the periphery of this glomerular tuft, we have this proliferation of visceral epithelial cells, podocytes, some more than two cell layers thick. And we can even see PAS positive protein resorption droplets in some of the cytoplasm of these podocytes. Um, but this collapse of the glomerular mm. tuft is what we're seeing here. So we have a little collapsing lesion mm. in this case as well. Mm. All right. Okay. All right. The plot thickens. So um, I don't have the pictures, but the immunofluorescence was negative. IgA was negative. Well, negative. So this is pretty much rules out your IgA diagnosis, true, which right. was... Um, which, uh, you know, the after the looking at the story. light, doesn't mm -hmm. feel like it would be IGA, mm -hmm. but, you but know, clinically, could have been. Story but was, what we keep on good. documenting here is and seeing here is the predominant vacuolization, right. deposition. So now some lipid deposition <coughs> disease yeah. is really up front here. So and, we, and we also have the FSGS in collapsing, yet this patient wasn't nephrotic. No, right? no. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and see what we, yeah. what we have. So for the viewers, I, as if you're reading along with us, I had no idea what I was looking at, too, when I saw this for the <laughs> first time, so Joe had to enlighten me. So this, you, we, we don't typically see a lot of these, but this is a toluidine blue stain. Okay. It's a, a thick plastic section that we use to scout um, the cuts, the sections for glomeruli prepared for electron microscopy. So this is that toluidine blue stain section. So this is actually a glomerulus here. Okay. So and what like, do you see? So, so this would be like an extremely low power EM. This is low, yeah, low, low power, low yeah. power yeah. Yeah. I guess you can think of it that way. <laughs> so telodine positive uh, uh, deposition uh, material that's seen exactly at the place where we're seeing light microscopy in the areas of the podocyte. So the podocyte is being, uh, has a deposition of stain positive material here. Right, it's, it's dark on telodine blue stain and you can, this is now highlighting that material that was present in those vacuolated podocytes that mm. we're seeing here nicely on the toluidine blue stain. Of course, we'll need to get a higher power view to see exactly what these are, but I thought this was a really nice, really nice picture. Right. So here's your high power view of what those are. So this is what we usually is called as zebra bodies that appears on the boards exactly like the same picture. <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, consistent with Fabry's disease. Uh, yes. I think it just, just strikes out um, this exact picture. So it's consistent with uh, glycosphingolipid uh, disorder and you have uh, deposition of lipids. Uh, and I think the area that we're looking right now is again in the podocyte area mm -hmm. and it's a EM. Um, uh, uh, again, it's kind of low power. <laughs> Low power view, uh, and it's um, and I can see the glomerular basement membrane. You have intact, hard to see at this view, but and the telial fenestrations I can see in the inside. Yes, exactly there and outside. Um, podocyte foot processes. Hard to say if they are effaced at this view, but we don't the see them too well. We don't see them too well right now. But I think the main striking thing is the zebra bodies mm -hmm. that just strikes out, and I think the whole case moves towards now Febreze, given this classic finding. Right, so that's Is very there any good. other view that you could, any other case that you will see zebra bodies that's not Febreze? Yes, yeah, so we'll, 
Um, let's just walk through the EM a little bit here. So when you're when you're looking at these, one way to approach it is always figure out where to figure out where things are. Find the glomerular basement membrane first. Look on the and you find some mesangium here. This is a little bit lower power, although we're still electron microscopy, so it's far higher power than anything we see on light microscopy. But here's our glomerular basement membrane. Mm -hmm. Here's our mesangium. Here's the capillary lumen, and here's the Bowman space. And you can see these are podocytes, uh, the cytoplasma podocytes that are just stuffed full of these laminated um, lipid inclusions. Mm -hmm. And this is what lipid inclusions look like on electron microscopy, and you can see them all over the place, just stuffing full the podocyte cytoplasm. Here's right. our, a detached podocyte up here, and you're right, you can't make out those uh, foot processes of the podocytes. They appear to be diffusely effaced, at least at this, at this representative image that we see here. Also, the other thing's important to note, all the negatives, we don't see any electron dense deposits, mm -hmm. which correlates with what we saw on immunofluorescence. Right. Um, and like you said, the glomerular base membranes are relatively normal thickness and the fenestrae are open and so on, but it's easier to see those on higher power. High so power. let's see what other images so we have. One more higher yes. power. So view. much more higher power view. So again, it's the podocyte cytoplasm um, is being s filled with these lipid um, laminated structures that we call zebra bodies. Right. And on the left, we have a GBM. Uh, with the inside endothelial fenestrations on the outside. I don't really, again, it's a little bit of higher power view. Probably we can see that it's effacement of foot processes here. Or right. I mean, this perhaps. is right where the podocyte right, cell right body is sitting right. right on top of it. So it's hard to see right. the foot processes right. in this in this. But again, the striking image. thing is this: these laminated uh, structures with these very specific patterns that they have consistent right. with the zebra bodies. Mm. So you mentioned Fabre's disease, right. which is the first thing that comes to your mind when you see this picture. I mean, that is that is high on your list of things. However, you asked, and it's also very important, could this be anything else? And there is something that that does happen. We've had a couple of cases here where this could be seen in an iatrogenic form, an iatrogenic phospholipidosis, which is chloroquine toxicity. Okay. Patients on Plaquenil can develop similar findings. So it's something to be, to put in the back of your mind, although this patient's not on anything. Um, but that's something else to to certainly to certainly think about. Okay. Well, oh, that's really interesting. I did not know that. So, like patients who have lupus, who are on plaquenil. anyone's on plaquenil. We actually had a case. Really? The other, um, it was earlier this year, yeah. of plaquenil toxicity mm -hmm. in an allograft. Interesting. That developed over year, and patients had had lupus was stable and had been taking plaquenil for a long time and developed this. Wow. Um, iatrogenic phospholipidosis from Plaquenil. Wow. So it can't happen. It's not always febrase. I'm okay. guessing but if you stop the drug, probably the lesion goes away. But I don't know if you'd ever right, biopsy them, but yeah. That's right, the assumption, guess, I guess. Right. The, the, kidney, the renal function does improve if you stop the drug in that scenario. That's okay. right. Fascinating. So this is, um, Usman nailed it based on the zebra bodies, which he saw in EM. Um, this is a, a nice diagnosis of febrase disease. So I'll just briefly talk about this. It's an X-linked inborn error of glycosphingolipid metabolism. It's the second most common lysosomal storage disease after Gaucher's disease. And the deficiency of the enzyme is actually alpha-galactosidase A. And the accumulation of the abnormal lipid that we are seeing is actually called global tri, tri uh, sl, uh, GB3. I'm just gonna call it GB3. And um, what happens is because of the lack of the enzyme, you are no longer able to cleave the terminal, terminal galactose from GB3, and the GB3 accumulates in the tissues, in the organs, um, and not only the kidney. So I think it's important to discuss kind of the, um, the phenotype of the disease throughout life. In early childhood, you can have numbness and pain and uh, tingling of the fingers, which this patient actually did have. Tail injectasias, Raynaud's phenomenon, Earlier in adulthood, they can develop the renal manifestations, al albuminuria, hematuria, uh, anhydrosis, which is the inability to sweat, is another um, uh, textbook case. And then later on in life, develops renal insufficiency. So actually, when you look back at the case and you saw the numbness and the tingling, right, you're kind of like, man, now. really should have been thinking harder about that one, <laughs> rather than IgA nephropathy. It's <laughs> pretty tough. That's a tough case. So yeah. anyway, that was a, I thought that was a neat case um, to demonstrate some very interesting pathology. Again, you guys know where to follow me. Uh, email me if any suggestions. Follow our YouTube channel. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, again, thanks to Joe and Usman for doing this, and we'll see you guys next month.